Okay, Hare Krishna. Today we are very, very fortunate. We are here in Radio Mayapur. It's a beautiful sunny day, it's clear sky in Mayapur. Um, uh, it reminds me a lot of uh, the spring in Italy <laughs> because it's a little cold in the morning, but then it gets warm during the day. Today we are very, very fortunate to have with us one of the senior disciples of Srila Prabhupada, His Grace uh, Rameshwar Prabhu, and he was born in... Uh, in Brooklyn in 1951, he studied in high school in 1950, then in 1960, and uh, I think in one of these concerts in 1969, you know, in this uh, big, uh, what was the name of the? I went to rock co concerts, yeah, rock concerts during my two-year phase. That was the biggest as concert. A, as a hippie. Yes, as a hippie was, uh, what was the name of the concert? Woodstock. But Woodstock, that, yes. That's what ended my hippie life, going right, to that right, festival right, right. and realizing there has to be a natural yogic way to achieve what everyone at this festival is trying to achieve through LSD and drugs. Right, right, right. So... But tell us a little bit about your previous, I mean, uh, as your family, uh, when you grew up in, uh, in okay. Brooklyn, about your father and mother, your brother and sister, a little bit about your family, where you... My father fought in World War II. Okay. And um, my grandparents emigrated to America in the early 1900s to escape pogroms. From where? On my father's side from Russia, there were terrible wow. pogroms. That's a uh, tax on people who are Jewish. Right. And on my mother's side, there were some pogroms going on in the city of Warsaw, Warsaw Poland. So they both, all, all four of them ended up coming to America around 1908, 1910. And my father fought in World War II. My um, grandparents on my mother's side tried very hard to rescue family members that were stuck in Europe and the US government would not give visas and so that part of my family they were annihilated so I carry that heritage from my family and I wanted to understand at a young age why would something like that be allowed to happen? I, I knew there was a God. Right. So people who have family through a, who have died in a genocidal holocaust naturally ask, why? How, is, how can we possibly rationalize such mass murder with a loving God? And I was determined not to become an atheist. I was determined to find the answers. I, I felt there must be really deep explanations because God is God. So I spent years of my life uh, searching for knowledge. So you were a seeker. You were a seeker of the truth. I was a person that was going to... Eastern bookstores looking for sages and <laughs> wisdom, and maybe a guru would walk in or out. Who knew? I was uh, uh, trying out different yoga ashrams uh, of all types, and none of that answered my questions. So, in my first year in college in Portland, Oregon, I became a strict vegetarian. So now I was following all four regulative principles and searching. There was not one professor in Reed College who was God-realized, so I was reading, spending a lot of time in their library and performing mental speculations. How am I going to find a way to understand yes, God. God. And then, at the beginning of my second year in Reed, I only stayed in the college for one month. The reason is, in those days, you went to college to figure out what you were going to do for the rest of your life. Of course. So once I figured it out, I, college didn't have any purpose for me anymore. 
So what happened in that month when school, my second year started is I was walking to campus when I heard the sweetest sounds of a Madunga and Cartel specialist. And I knew something about Indian music and I was just drawn. What is this? It's on the street. It's not a concert hall. And I followed the sound vibrations. Now I knew that you needed a mantra and a guru and I was in this reading of books that it's so romantic you have to go to the Himalayas to base yourself in front of a yogi, serve him for 20 years, maybe he'll give you a mantra and that was the romantic speculation <laughs> of the day. So I'm following the sound of these kartals and murdanga and then I'm hearing the mantra, Maha Mantra being chanted. Mm. And I turn the corner and I see about seven or eight devotees on the streets of Portland. And I froze. <laughs> I said, oh my God, because I didn't know Krishna yet. Yes. Oh my God. Who are these These guys? are the most advanced sages and yogis on the planet Earth. Instead of me having to go to some cave in the Himalayas, look at them. They yeah. are bringing the mantras to the public, and it's for free. All of that was flooding into my brain. I said, I have to chant with these people. I have to find out who they are. And I received the Mahamadra in that way oh, nice. through Srila Prabhupada's Harinam Sankirtan party led by Lochan Prabhu, mm -hmm. who is the president, who is also the famous devotee artist who sculpted all Prabhupada. the Prabhupada Murtis on all yes, the Asasans yes. in He's his famous. God. He's famous. He was my temple president. He was leading the Kirtan party because uh, that's what they did, eight hours a day of Harinam. So, every day, walking to school, I was praying, please let me hear the sound of the cartel Again. so I can find where they are. Because there was no internet, there was no way for them to post where they were yeah. going to be. And I would say uh, three days a week, I would actually find them. Wow. And on those days, I would mean that meant I wouldn't go to class. <laughs> you would follow them. I would chat with them. Oh, nice. And after a month, and you know, in between the kirtan stops and someone's talking to the public, I'm listening. And Lochan was also preaching to me privately. And I knew this is my future. This is it. I. I was ready to live in a cave. I was certainly in living in <laughs> ashrams the prior summers. I am ready to live with them. I'll shave my head. I'll do whatever it takes. <laughs> because I look at, this is the answer. that This is the place I can get all my answers. So one day, Lojan saw I was like in great um, distress facially. He could tell. And he went up to me. He left the kirtan and said, what's wrong? And I said, Lochan, I really want to take this lifestyle. I want to do this. But I think it will crush and hurt my parents so badly. I'm the firstborn. And the idea of leaving for yoga ashram, but this is more than that. This is a whole lifestyle. The whole culture is so different. It'll crush them. And I'm hesitant. I don't want to cause that pain course, to my family. Of course. And Lochan was very compassionate on me. And he explained to me that Prabhupada has written and Krishna says that if you can become a pure devotee, then so many generations of your family will be liberated because you're a lover of God and that's what God does in reciprocation with the devotees who are pure and when he said that to me I felt Krishna was speaking to me in my heart I had felt 
God speaking to me on two or three other occasions throughout my life. And this time I felt God was speaking to me from within, telling me what he just said is the absolute truth. You do this and your family will be saved. And I just, at that moment, between what he said and what I was hearing inside, I felt completely free. I felt liberated. I knew I could do this now. Mm-hmm. So I was so emotional that I fell down on the sidewalk holding his feet like a full dundabat and I was crying like a baby. <laughs> and in between my sobs, all I kept saying was, you've saved me. You've saved me. So then, when I was able to compose myself, and you know, that they're all the kirtan devotees, they knew me. They're looking at this scene. <laughs> and I stood up. And I said, thank you very much. I turned and ran as fast as I could. So they must have been thinking, this guy's insane. He just (laughs) ran away after he just went through that. I was running to my, we had rented a house. It was a yoga house. And I was, all read students practicing yoga. And I was the leader of that house. And so I run to the house and I start packing whatever little belongings I owned in the world. And my friends in the house, what are you doing? I said, I'm leaving. You take over the house. I carried all my records and books and whatever to the Reed College campus, set up a picnic table and sold all my possessions, whatever I owned. And that night around eight o'clock, I was finished. I got some money and I found the temple. I'd never been to the temple until that night. So I'm knocking on the door. Now they don't normally get guests at eight or eight thirty at night. Lochan opens the door and says, Robert, that was my name, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, I came to beg you to let me live with you. I want to move in if you'll allow it. And I have some money that I would like to give to you. It paid for the next four or five months rent. And he allowed me to come in. So that is how I actually joined this guy. Through the holy names and the representatives of Srila Prabhupada taking the time to explain to a conditioned soul what our what the philosophy is and what the potency of the holy name was and i had felt it so amazing but what was the reaction of your parents i mean your father and mother when they came to know that my parents you... friends like many people who had been th- going through this mm-hmm. thought and told my father we think you should cut him off disown him, at the very least take his name out of your will. And my father said, I can't do that, he's my son. (laughs) I will never close the door to him. So that's how my parents withstood the social pressure of a Jewish boy becoming a Hindu boy. <laughs> well, they didn't know it was Hare Krishna yet, so they called it Hindu. <laughs> but eventually they came and visit you in the temple. And the oh, yes. Body. Well, in my travels to India, my parents lived in a nice place in Florida. And I would fly back to America through New York. And often I was carrying some respiratory ailment or something that I picked up. I would fly down to Florida and spend two or three days recuperating. I'm their son. They welcomed me. I got to preach to them. And then I would fly back to New Dorca. And um, when we bought the 55th Street, 
skyscraper probably Beautiful. called it. Um, my father's business f- associate came to visit me after he told my father, I'm bringing, he called me Bobby, I'm yeah. bringing Bobby home. Yeah. I'm fully initiated. <laughs> this is 1976, which meant I was sannyas, which Prabhupada gave me in the beginning of 76. And my father's business associate was a super handsome, like actor-like handsome features and like a super amazing salesperson to get people of great substance to invest in their products. So he was convinced he could sell anything to anyone. He could certainly convince me to go home. So after about 30 or 40 minutes, I saw where this was going. And I asked one of the brahmacharis, please do me a favor. Get me four or five of the tallest brahmacharis you can find in this temple right now and bring them to this room to escort my father's friend out. Because he was trying to, at some point, he was trying the, uh, I'm f- I'm stronger, taller, intimidating. And he, he, he respected that I escorted him, had him escorted out. And the reason I know that is two years later, my parents and this man, Richard, and his young wife flew out to L.A. to visit me in New Dorca. Nice. To go through the Bhagavad Gita uh, Diorama Museum, yes. to see the deities, to honor Prasadam. My father was giving a, he gave a nice donation of about $5,000 just on, after we went through that Gita Museum. Yeah. Then I took them out to the Pyramid House, which was run by Nishringananda Prabhu at the time. Yes. Well, he still runs it. Yes. And at this point, both families are so respectful. They they just they couldn't believe how great that museum was. And they realized this is a true, ancient, deep spiritual tradition. It's got roots that go back older than Judaism. And they're so respectful. So they were getting very attracted. And at the end of the day at the Pyramid House, uh, Richard's young wife comes up to me and says, I've discussed it with Richard. He would do anything she asks. Will you allow me to move into the pyramid house and become a Hare Krishna? (laughs) So the man who tried to deprogram me is now letting his wife, he's giving his blessing for her to become a devotee. But I realized she's never chanted Japa. She never read the Bhagavad Gita. I gave her a Bhagavad Gita and said... I can't remember her name, but I said, my dear friend, wife of my father's friend, you have to read this and then decide if this is going to answer the questions that you're seeking in your life. And if you decide it does, you come back and we'll let you live here. Absolutely. So that was the last time I ever saw her, of (laughs) course. He moved to France with her. But... um, so that's my inter- that's my interactions yeah. with my family. Nice. At the end, they were extremely favorable. They believed this philosophy. My father was very intelligent, fully believed in transmigration. And um, as for my mother, she survived my father by 10 years. And she was very ill during part of those years. I had her move in with me. They sold the place in Florida, and I was taking care of her. Nice. The way she took care of me when I was a baby. Absolutely. And I would show for her. At this time, I was still working professionally, and her favorite kirtans, of all the kirtans I played for her, were the Vishnu John Swami kirtans. So sweet. She loved listening to him chant. She would tap her hands with the Madunga playing. And so my parents got some benefit Absolutely. by associating with devotees. But tell us how. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> tell us the first time you saw Srila Prabhupada, your oh. impression, aware, <laughs> and how it happened. 
and what transformation or emotion give to your heart? Hare Krishna. There's a tiny background to this. Sure. Lokchan had told Karandar, who was our GBC for the Western Zone, that he had made a devotee, Bhakti Ra Bhakta Robert, who was, he, Lokchan thought I was some kind of extreme or fanatical devotee from a past <laughs> life. <laughs> My first day in the Portland Temple, I was out distributing books to bookstores. It was like, what else could I do? That's what I felt my first day to be a book distributor. So anyway, Karunder came up to visit and check out what I was, who I was, and decided that he needed an assistant for the BBT work, for the publishing work he was doing. BBT didn't exist yet under that name. And he told Lochan he would like to take me to be his assistant. And Lotron said, no, no, no. <laughs> He's our book distributor. He gives all the classes. I wasn't initiated yet. And um, so they came to an understanding, an agreement, that next June, 71, Srila Prabhupada was going to be flying to San Francisco for the famous San Francisco Ratiatra in Golden Gate Park. Right. So the plant, all the temples, north and south, all merged oh. and came to San Francisco, especially if Prabhupada was coming. Of course. So the plan was I would drive down with my yatra, and at the end of the festival, I would leave for L.A. with Karandar. And that was the plan. So... On the morning of the Rathiatra, Prabhupada was first arriving in time for the parade. And on the morning of the Rathiatra, Karandar and his brother, who was the president of San Francisco Temple, Keshava, they had assigned me to set up the prasadam distribution at Golden Gate Park. So they dropped me off at around 7.30 with three picnic tables and one other devotee and we were setting everything up. And the nature of that park, when they see a sign that says free feast, <laughs> naturally people just start coming over. And so we were serving out the prasadam and never had a chance to even see the Rathiatra procession which Prabhupada was sitting on the court. So I'd never seen Prabhupada yet. <laughs> so there's a two-hour parade, and they come to the stage, and Vishnu John is leading the kirtan, and then alternating with Sukadev. And between these two voices, these were like celestial voices. More than that, they were like... Gandharvas. <laughs> they were... Like, no, they were... Transcendental sound vibrations were coming through their through their voices, and it was the most ecstatic here. Done, there were ten thousand people at least in Golden Gate Park, jumping and dancing, and and Prabhupada was so happy to see this, and he gave a talk and everything. So finally, it's maybe one or two in the afternoon. Srila Prabhupada says, "Please bring me a plate of prasadam." So, one of the devotees runs to these picnic tables, and I made up a paper plate. No one had thought to bring out Prabhupada's plate. So, on this paper plate, I put the cold, nice, delicious potato salad, the nice, delicious chip rice, a spoon of halwa, and a Dixie cup of lemonade. And I said, this is what we're distributing. And I gave a plastic spoon. So the devotee brings it back to the stage. This was one of those moments where you had to be so in love with Prabhupada because when he gets angry at you, you have to think of it like flowers. 
not like arrows, but like flowers. So Prabhupada was yelling at Keshava and Karandar, you are never, this is God of the universe. These people are his guests and you are serving this meager, cold food as his feast. Prabhupada was really upset. Lesson learned, never again was there ever going to be an insignificant feast at Arathiatra. Prabhupada wouldn't touch it. He looked at it and wouldn't even taste any of it, including the lemonade. So Prabhupada said, bring me some water. So now a devotee comes running up to the picnic tables where I am. I hadn't been relieved yet. And says, Prabhupada's asking for water. Well, Prabhu, we don't have water here. We have lemonade. Why would we have water? The bottles of water did not exist in 1971. Yeah, yeah. There was no <laughs> So I'm thinking, okay, my guru wants a, a drink of water. So I told this devotee, you stay here and keep serving out the food. And I ran to find a park ranger, which I did. And I was very sincerely begging him, you have to go to the park ranger station, unlock it, and turn on the water spigot. I must bring my guru a drink wow. of water. And he, the park ranger did that. Wow. And I filled up two Dixie cups with water, <laughs> little tiny little, little tiny cheap little Dixie cheap. cups, and carried them back to the picnic table without spilling too much, and said, here's the water. In a Dix in a cheap plastic Dixie cup, so that was my that was how I was serving prasadam to Prabhupada. Little did I know. Yeah. So finally, at, after this, the kirtan starts again, and Karanda realizes, you know, I'm bringing this boy with to back to L.A. to be my assistant, and I've left him at this table since seven in the morning. He's never seen Prabhupada yet. So Karanda walks over with another devotee. And finally brings my relief and tells me, go find your way through this crowd. Find a spot where you can see Prabhupada. So that was how, but that's the background setting of my first Seeing Prabhupada. vision in person of Srila Prabhupada. And what I felt you have heard from other devotees, I am sure. Prabhupada had this had many had so many spiritual abilities. He's not his even his his body is a spiritual body. It's not like a a mundane human body mm -hmm. with a, a realized soul inside. Everything about Prabhupada was surcharged with spiritual energies and potencies. So I felt Prabhupada looking at this whole crowd of thousands and thousands of people jumping and looking right at me. And in a most loving glance, looking right into my heart. And I felt through his glance, he was accepting me. I, I, I had so much faith and this all happened through his glance, this perception that I'm the only one he's looking at. <laughs> now, obviously, Krishna Leela, Krishna does that many times, but Prabhupada can do that as well. And feeling his glance of love, but then I when? burst into tears yes. and was crying. I didn't fall down this time. But I was crying like a baby, chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, thanking God for Prabhupada. So that's my actual first experience of seeing Prabhupada and feeling him through his glance, changing my life. From that glance alone, I knew I was going to give everything of my life, my whatever I am, I'm giving to him. He, Baba, you own it. You own me. That's what. That's what that glance made me feel. 
full surrender. And then Krishna. when did you meet him uh, personally? You spoke. In a personal, close. Yeah. Yeah, Karanda nice. allowed me to go on a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada nice. in late 1971. Now you have to understand the Bhagavad Gita as it is, Macmillan edition, did not come out until 1972. Yeah. So we're on this great morning walk and this, now I'm like with Prabhupada and Prabhupada's looking at me and he, he actually asked me a question. Do you read Bhagavad Gita? And I said, oh yes, Srila Prabhupada. Because we had this little purple, abridged Bhagavad Gita that we all read. Yeah, yeah. It was 100% in English. No Devanagari, no Sanskrit slokas, no word for word meanings, just English translation and purports. Abridged. So I said, oh yes, Prabhupada, because I love that Gita. So then Prabhupada said, he starts quoting a verse in Sanskrit and looks at me and says, you know this verse? <laughs> so I was completely dumbfounded. I, I, I couldn't even imagine how I would know Sanskrit yet. And I, other than the Bhagavatam class, we did recite the so Sanskrit God. text. I said, Prabhupada, I do not know this. I'm sorry. And then he looked at me and said, but you said you read my books. So following that wonderful exchange, and it was a very serious lesson. Of course. That I better be much more serious about studying Prabhupada's books. And I was, I thought, very serious. But I was afraid to go on another morning walk. And... Um, that carried over into 1972. Now, we were distributing Krishna books door to door, and we were in such bliss. I was a Sankirtan <gasps> book distributor, but also the Sankirtan leader of the temple. And Prabhupada was coming and staying for weeks and weeks at a time, translating. That's when he gave the Queen Kunti lecture series that became teachings of Queen Kunti, and just... 1972 was that special time with Prabhupada. And I went on a few morning walks, but what really changed my whole relationship forever with Prabhupada was in December of 1972, Prabhupada was not in Los Angeles. He was in India. And we had this idea that this door-to-door, -door, even if you are the strongest, fastest book distributor, how many doors can you get to in one day? Could you get to 200 doors? Could you actually meet who's ever home in 200 houses? And I said, but these stores, people are going shopping from early morning practically until midnight. The number of people you can meet in a, at a store it's like a whole day of door-to-door -door book distribution, you could meet that number of people in a half an hour. So it just dawned on us. We filled up, we had about 15 Sankraton devotees. We filled up cars. We plotted which store we're dropping you off at with boxes and boxes of books. We had a devotee drive around with late prasadam in the afternoon. And that was the first day of what is now the famous Christmas Marathon. Right. It was a three-day event. So on this first day, with everyone at a different store, and it's unimportant what store I was at, but it was beginning to slow down by 11 at night. <laughs> and I had already distributed more than 400 books and I had collected easily more than four hundred dollars, which in nineteen seventy two seemed to be a lot of books and a lot of Lakshmi, because by the only comparison was the door to door, yes. <laughs> where you could do seven Krishna books and you were considered a Maharati. So, my false ego took over, 
and said, it's slowing down. I know the devotees will be so excited to hear what happened, what the results are. I think I should go back to the temple before they all take rest. So I got back to the temple. It was around 1130, maybe 1140. And I walk into the Sankirtan office, which is, the, at that time, the LA temple had a front office. Karunda's office, where he slept, was on one side of that lobby, vestibule office, and the Sankatan office was on the other side. So I walk in, and there's this one devotee who was assisting with a blackboard, writing down all the names, whatever the scores were going to be. So I walk in, I'm so excited, and there's nobody there but this one devotee, Mayapur. And I said, oh, I see, everyone went to take rest. And Mayapur says, no, Prabhu, you're the first one back. <laughs> so that was one of the great lessons of my life. I left conditioned souls at the door of this store. Yes, it wasn't as busy, but they were still out there. The store was going to close at midnight, and I, I left. I was a frontline soldier, and I left. And... I will never do that again. I never made that mistake again. It was just unbearable. The pain of that realization. Now I'm sitting there all by myself waiting for everyone else to come home. And one devotee actually beat me that day. Mula Prakriti. Wow. I mean, we had the greatest, I mean, we had, we had the greatest Sankirtan devotees, men and women. And I came in second on that day, but it didn't matter. We had these brown sacks of Lakshmi. <laughs> and they were piling up on the desk and we were we were so ecstatic from the whole experience we ne no one had ever distributed this many books before ever and no one had collected this much on book distribution ever and we were literally as if you had eaten 10 gulab jamans we were spiritually intoxicated beyond Imagination. The, beyond imagination. <laughs> no, beyond eating all those gulab jamans. It was real ecstasy. And we're talking to each other about what we would say and how we got people. And there was no way we were going to bed. We were looking at each other. Is there any place we could go now? It's like <laughs> 1 in the morning it. or something, one thirty. So finally the noise of our partying and we were, that was a spiritual party we were having. Karunda wakes up and comes in, rubbing his eyes, and says, what is going on? And then he stops in mid-sentence, looks at us in ecstasy, looks at the bags of Lakshmi, and starts laughing so hard. He says, okay, I'll hear about this tomorrow. I want every one of you to go now Control your minds. Go take rest because first thing tomorrow morning, you're going back out. And somehow we calmed ourselves, which was an effort. Of course. And we went out for two more days and nights like that. So after three days, you know, temples would sell, if they were really successful, they would maybe sell a thousand back to God heads a month. A month. Wow. And the door-to-door -door Krishna books, you know, if they sold 10 and 15 a day and they went out for 25 days, this group of 15 devotees sold approximately 18,000 literatures in three days. It was unheard of. There was the beginning of mass book distribution in Iskand. <laughs> that that was it. It was that's where it started. So at the end of the marathon, I wrote my first letter to Srila Prabhupada. I described what we had done, where you know how we, how the devotees all went, and how they're so sincere, and sold so many books. Amazing. And I ended by saying, Prabhupada, we want to do this for the rest of our lives. We hope you allow us to. It was too, ha we were too happy. <laughs> Prabhupada was also happy. Well, Prabhupada got that letter and had never heard such scores, ever. <clears throat> In fact, 
The only time Prabhupada ever sent out telegrams when, when he considered to be like very, very urgent. And he started sending out <laughs> telegrams to the GBCs who were located around the globe, telling them what had just happened. And then Prabhupada wrote to me my first letter. And um, it was all about book distribution. <laughs> and my, my now relationship with Prabhupada through book distribution was now the, the spiritual connection, unbreakable, unbreakable connection. That's how I felt. Amazing. Wonderful times in the time of book distribution. So that was at the end of 1972. And all through 1973, our Sankirtan party was so creative, we were inventing new places to go to distribute. We had never been to rock concerts with our books before. And Triparari said, I'm going to try going to the airport, thinking I can distribute not just to local people, I can get Prabhupada's books to travel throughout the whole world if I'm at an international airport. <laughs> and so Triparari and I were like, like as close family brothers as you can imagine. And in each of our ways, we were leading the Sankirtan army that had developed in New Dwarka. And... Every month there was another experience. We tried something new and it was an expl another explosion. And then a tragedy in my life happened at the end of 1973. Karundar, who had been as close to Prabhupada as any GBC had ever was, he was traveling with Prabhupada to Japan to negotiate with Dai Nippon. He, everyone thought of Karundar as like practically, God, at least self-realized. He was so grave and serious and and fixed. And now at the end of 73, he wants to step down. And for me, it was, he was my mentor. So I didn't know how to process that. And he was the leader of our zone, but also of the New Dorka Temple. So, Prabhupada was in Hawaii when this news came out and Prabhupada's secretary called to ask how will things go on. So Jayatirtha and I were two leaders in the temple. We discussed it and we felt I, I'm the only one that knows what Karunder does all these years, so yeah. I can probably carry on his work yeah. in the BBT. And you know all the work he did at the temples. You could carry that on. And so we flew to Hawaii together and presented this plan to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada approved it. That's when I introduced to Prabhupada the idea that Prabhupada, from now on, every check that's coming out of the BBT will have two signatures, not one. Mm. You're asking me to be the manager of the BBT and I would like to add Jayatirtha as the co-signer. Prabhupada loved the idea, more security for his fund, yeah. for his BBT. And so all through 1974, I'm running the BBT from the LA side. Bali Mardan is still running the BBT press from the Brooklyn side. And the first thing I did after this appointment is I flew out to Brooklyn to meet with the press devotees. I have to know what books are coming up. What's the plan? How, you know, what, which books are we going to reprint? Are there any changes and all? I was very innocent. And they felt that they would set they would provide instructions to me or set the goals for me, which was fine as far as I was concerned. So they had told me, we've been working on two projects. We have a, a new artist. He's redone all the cover page of every chapter, line drawings for the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. 
He's made beautiful line drawings. We want you to take them back and show them to Prabhupada, one for each chapter. And then they said, we feel that the original Krishna book art marathon of 1969, while it was so successful, some of the first third of the paintings, they're very innocent, almost childlike. Yes. But they're pure, but they're innocent. And our technique has gotten so much better better. This is 1973. No, it's 1974. Sorry. So they said, we would like to take out some of the innocent childlike art and replace it with this. And they gave me a whole stack to take back to Srila Prabhupada to show him. So I fly back to L.A., having met with all the press devotees, and now I'm going to have my first one-on-one -on -one meeting with Prabhupada uh, about, as his BBT manager. I was the BBT secretary in the trust document, but now I'm the manager. And I started off by showing Prabhupada all the line drawings for the TLC, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Prabhupada's memory was so flawless. He knew every line drawing without saying, get me a teachings of Lord Chaitanya so we could compare. He knew every word in his books. There is a great myth that sometimes Prabhupada didn't know all, if the editors would add something or change something. Prabhupada knew every single word in his books and he knew every single drawing or painting in his books. They were his books and to Prabhupada, they were deities. He knew everything. This may sound controversial to some, but it's so obvious to me. Yes. So anyway... As we were going through all these new line drawings, Prabhupada was pointing out how each one was inadequate or the context or the, um, the composition was wrong. The originals were all better. And so Prabhupada decided, whatever Govinda Dasi had done with Gorsunder, we are keeping. All of these are rejected. I said, okay. Now it's time to show Prabhupada the changes that the art department and the press want to make to his Krishna book. You know, anyone who knows the history of what it took to get this Krishna book produced and painted for and, and, and paid for and printed would never, ever have thought to do the presentation I was about to do. <laughs> but I didn't know all that intimate history yet. And so I said, Srila Prabhupada, we're getting ready to reprint the Krishna book. And the artists have some suggestions that we would like to it we would like to add paintings because their style and technique is so much better than when they first started painting. And so he first said, Oh, so they want to add art? Add? I said, not exactly, Srila Prabhupada. They want to replace some of the old paintings with some of the newer ones. He said, adding you can do. Replacing? After I, after I have approved it? Okay, show me. And so we started going through what the artists considered to be superior techniques for Krishna Leelas. And three, I mean, there were many more than three, but three paintings really stand out in my mind. The first one was their painting of Putana mm -hmm. and Krishna killing the demon witch Putana. And Srila Prabhupada looked at that painting, which technically was very well executed, shaking his head, no. He said, this is an ugly mass. They have painted Putin and uh, this, is, this is not pleasing, this is ugly. No, rejected. 
Now, by now, we had a trend of Prabhupada rejecting every suggestion. So the next one, and I subtly, probably my false ego, I had been saying, Prabhupada, we would like to do this. We'd like to put this one in. I had shifted. To, Prabhupada, they would like to now take out this painting and put this one in. They, not me. <laughs> I was so afraid of how angry Prabhupada was getting. So there's a painting of Krishna running. His hair is flowing and wild on, and there's near rocks and so on. It had been actually printed in one of the earliest uh, Third Canto volumes. And Prabhupada looked at that painting and said, this is, this is wild. This, the way this looks, the way they've shown Krishna, it's wild. No, this is not an improvement. Reject it. And now we came to the final <laughs> painting that they wanted to insert. And no one's ever seen the one that they wanted to insert, especially after what happened with Prabhupada. I said, Srila Prabhupada, they want to take out the Ras Lila painting, which is a two-page painting, yes. and put in a new Ras Lila, which they feel is, is better. Now, this original Ras Lila painting hangs on Srila Prabhupada's bedroom wall. Now, it's on the wall, then there's his bed, then there's this big doorway without a door, a big opening, and then there's his sitting desk where he translates. So, you have to picture this. As Prabhupada is taking rest, the last thing he sees with his eyes is that Ras Lila painting. When Prabhupada ri rises, the first thing he sees with these eyes is that Ras Lila painting. When Prabhupada is sitting at his desk, whatever's going on in that room, whether he's translating or meeting people, he looks through the doorway and he sees the Ras Lila painting. It was his favorite painting <laughs> by Devahuti. So this was so ominous that, that they wanted to take that. Change. So I showed Prabhupada what they wanted to do, put in. And Prabhupada was looking at this whole thing in total disbelief that we're about to destroy his books. We're about to make changes based on our ridiculously lack of pure Krishna consciousness vision, all speculative on what's good, what's not good. And Prabhupada just could foresee this change disease could ruin the whole movement. He starts yelling as he's looking at this painting. He was more than yelling. He was banging his right hand fist on his desk as he was yelling and saying, look at this. Look at their hairs. Look how wild the gopis are. This is hippie dance. Hippie seeds. He was so angry and he felt that this nonsense hippie mentality or conception of pure love had creeped into this ridiculous painting, whereas Deva Hoodie's painting was so blissful and divine, divine. He was so mad. And finally, he looked through the doorway at the Ras Lila painting. Now, he was yelling, very loudly yelling. His servant was Sudama at the time. Sudama comes running in. So what happened? He hears yelling and he hears pounding on the desk and he's wondering, is Prabhupada under attack? <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> he opens the door and sees Prabhupada blasting me, yelling at me, so angry, like the Shringadev anger. And Sudama had never seen anything like this. He couldn't even make it all the way through the door to bow down and offer his obeisances. He literally stood at the doorway, standing on one foot, his other foot, like the knee was up in the air, and with his arm, 
He was covering his eyes. He couldn't bear to see Prabhupada so angry, so unhappy. It was unbearable for him. And so finally, when Prabhupada was certain that I had gotten the message, sure. <laughs> he looks at me one last time and with his finger, he says, get out. <laughs> so this is my first meeting privately with Srila Prabhupada about his BBT and about printing his books. And it's the most ecstatic experiences that I've had with Prabhupada when he pounds a lesson into me and whips me and beats me because it's so it's so intense but it's love. Yes. Prabhupada's protecting his books, which is sure. non-different from Krishna, which are the law books for humanity for 10,000 years. years. Of course, he's protecting them and teaching me the lesson that they must be protected. No changes. He said no changes in my books. So what a wonderful experience that was yes. for my first private BBT meeting with Prabhupada. It was either January or February of 1974. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm sure you have a lot of story and pastimes, but what time is running over. So would you like to give a message to people who are listening to our radio Mayapur today? What is the message of love to inspire all the devotees to remain faithful to Srila Prabhupada, read his books and uh, practice in Krishna consciousness? Srila Prabhupada said to all of us in the last year, when we're praying and having kirtans and chanting rounds for his health and praying that he would stay, Srila Prabhupada said to all of us, I will never die. I will live in my books. So it is our duty to read every day. What, what that meant is that whatever generation you are of, you have direct association with Srila Prabhupada, who is living in his books. It doesn't matter whether you were physically with him when he walked this earth, because he will never die. He will always live and speak to you through his books. You read a few sentences and he's speaking to you and teaching you. And a week later, if you read the next, the same sentences, you'd get even more out of it. Yes. yes. That's Prabhupada's potency as a Jagat guru for the world, savior of the world. But the other thing about Srila Prabhupada is in the same way that Krishna loves every soul, without fail, Krishna's in our heart. Yes. Even when we're in the body of a st stool-eating worm. <laughs> How much love Krishna has for every soul. Well, Prabhupada has come into this universe as his Shaktivesh Avatara, as his representative of that love for every single soul. No matter where you were on the planet when Prabhupada was here, you felt he loved you. You felt for the first time, I'm falling in love. I never knew what love was. Now I know. I fell in love with Prabhupada. Every devotee of any generation can have that same experience because Prabhupada is present in his books. He is an unlimited ocean of love for you. And when you realize that and read his books in that state of mind, you'll feel yourself completely falling in love with Srila Prabhupada as your eternal Siksha Guru. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Ramesh Prabhu, it's been a great pleasure to have you with us today. And uh, we are sure that we'll again have some more podcasts and listen to some more podcasts. It's always a pleasure to remember Srila Prabhupada always. and speak about Srila Prabhupada always. and share whatever we can share of Prabhupada with others. It's bliss for everyone. Thank Hare you Krishna. so much.
Hare Thank you. Krishna. Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Let us chant Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Rama Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. Shila Prabhupada ki jai. Ananta Koti Vaishnava Rinda ki jai. Go from Ananta. Hare Krishna. And thank you very much. Now your editor Splicer can chop it to pieces. No, no, we can't do that.